you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we are going through the book of Romans verse by verse and line by line. And today we are going to talk about suffering. We'll talk about suffering. Folks, it is a part of life. You cannot avoid it. Uh, suffering is, is hard on you, uh, even especially when we speak of death, that separation of a loved one. But there is a lot of suffering going on in our world today. But folks, God has the answer. God's Word will encourage you today. And so I want to give you my outline as we first start. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, there's an outline there for you to take notes. Suffering, number one, creation groans. Creation groans. Number two, believers groan. Folks, we groan. We are hurting. There are people hurting all around us, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And number three, the Holy Spirit groans also. The Holy Spirit groans. If anyone knew much about suffering, it was the Apostle Paul. From being in prison to beatings, he suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. But truly, nobody suffered as much as D Jesus did uh, on the way to Calvary and at his crucifixion and death. As Christians, we are not exempt from suffering while living here on earth. The blessing of suffering is to know that one day all suffering is going to end and we will be free from this body that we have here and now. We also have an amazing hope that non-believers do not have. Our present suffering comes through persecution of man, the aging process of mankind, and the pains of life in general as we know it. But praise God, one day all of our suffering will end. We will receive our glorified bodies and spend all of eternity in a perfect place called heaven. Let's look at some amazing scriptures found in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 18, creation groans. And Paul starts this part, or this section of Romans 8, with a very positive note. For I, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And you think about suffering. We do it for a limited amount of time. Even situations in our lives are, you know, are a limited time. Suffering and death, I know, is a huge part of that. And issues, health issues, uh, loss of finances, there are so many things, but they are just for a season. And when you think about if we live 70 years compared to all of eternity and what is going to happen to the Christians. Paul is uh, spinning this in a positive manner, saying we need to remember whose we are, and we need to remember all this is going to change one day. And that anticipation, that hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. And it's not a I hope so uh, type. F faith says I know so. I know this is true in my heart of hearts. I know one day I'm not going to be suffering anymore. I'm going to see those loved ones that pass before me. And I'm going to rejoice and see our Savior face to face. And then verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Folks, I am telling you, God is up to something. God is just waiting. Jesus is just waiting. Jesus is in the, at the right hand of God, waiting for God to say this, go get my bride. And I am telling you, one day in a church somewhere, or in a house somewhere, or a situation somewhere, the last person will be saved. And I'm telling you, everything will change. All of eternity will come to pass. Verse 20, for the creation was subject to uh, futility, not willingly, 
but because of him who subjected it in hope. And folks, it all started out perfect. It all started out a utopia in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 1. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis 1. Verse 29. Genesis 1. And we know Genesis 1 was the creation of everything that you see here. And God said in Genesis 1, 29, See, I have given you every herb that uh, yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, which is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Oh, folks, the Garden of Eden was a utopia. The Garden of Eden was a perfect place. But we know, we know what Adam and Eve did. We know there was only one rule. One thing that God told them not to do, do not eat of the uh, tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life. When you do that, and if you do that, everything will change. And we know in chapter 3, Satan come after Eve first. And, And that conversation led to temptation. And that bite of the apple, and Adam Uh, bit that apple, and folks, everything changed after that. Look at Genesis 3, verse 17. Genesis 3, 17. Then, Then to Adam he said, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Folks, there's always consequences to sin. Consequences. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall bring you bring forth to you. And you shall eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Folks, death came into the scene, hurting Pain, sorrow came on the scene because of Adam and Eve's sin. And folks, uh, creation is groaning. There is suffering even in creation. You think of what is going on in our world today. Uh, We have floods, we have earthquakes, fires, we have droughts, we have tornadoes, we have volcanoes. All these things are going on in the earth because of the fall of mankind. We no longer live in a perfect place. We no longer live in a perfect environment. And man, I am telling you, they are getting worse. It's not getting better. I am not trying to show you gloom and doom. I'm telling you the facts of life. If you are living here today, you are suffering in some way. Folks, I've been beside the bed of cancer patients. I watched my own mother die of cancer. And there's nothing you can do about it except pray to God the Father. But the good news is, when a Christian dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Folks, we have a future that other people don't have. We are going to a perfect place. There is nothing perfect here on earth. And we will live forever with our Lord and Savior. Look at what it says in verse 21, back in our text. Because the creation itself also will be delivered up from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Folks, we have something to look forward to. When we die... We will be with the Lord. You are going to see God's glory. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. And Paul takes this groaning and compares it to a woman having birth pains. And folks, I'm telling you, 
I've heard kidney stones are much like those, but I am so glad Eve was chosen to give birth to our children. I am so glad. I'll never forget my, the story of my, my sister and her husband, my youngest sister, and she was giving birth, and he was in the room and holding her hand, and she would, she would you know, have those pains and hurt really, really bad, and then they would cease. And then one of those times when it ceased and it was over, he said, oh, it can't be that bad. <laughs> you know what she did? Smack. She smacked him <laughs> right there. Ladies, we know it's bad. Okay, and that is an example, folks, an example of birth pains. This world, you think of the weather changes, you think of everything that is going on now, everything is like on steroids when it comes to what's going on in our world. The disease, the death, okay, uh, you know, COVID, all these things, they're getting more intense and more intense. And folks, we will be relieved from that. God is going to make all things right. Matter of fact, it is going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. Hold your finger there and go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. And see, even with all the pain and all the groans, God has an answer for every one of those. He has an answer. Look what it says in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works uh, that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will dissolve, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. He's saying, now we're suffering, but we need to keep our Christianity. We need to be life examples. We need to be holy in our words and in our conduct. And folks, right now we are just waiting for the rapture of the church. I can't tell you how many people in the last month have just said, man, I wish the rapture would occur. I just wish, and, and it's that hope that we have. 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. Folks, that is what is going. I believe the next things on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. When we are raptured out of this place, and we know that'll ascend all of history, everything will change after that. And it'll go right into the tribulation period. And there'll be three and a half years of good things good times, and then right in the middle of it, I'm telling you, everything will change, and the Antichrist will come on the scene. And at the end of it, the battle of Armageddon, and I'm telling you that Jesus is coming. Don't get the rapture of the church mixed up with the second coming. He's talking about the second coming, and I'm telling you, Jesus is coming on a white horse. We will be with him. He will defeat the devil, and we will live in victory forever and ever and ever. Looking, looking forward to the hasting of the coming of the day of God. Folks, I am looking forward to it. Why? Man, creation is groaning. It's hot out there. It's hot. And folks, we are going to a perfect place called heaven because of which the heavens will be dissolved on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Revelation 21, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. You know the only people that are not looking for and, and looking at the rapture of the church in a positive person or in a positive way is a person that is not ready to go. There may be one here today that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I'm not trying to scare you at all. I'm simply saying the rapture of the church could happen today. Today could be 
your day of salvation. Today, if you would ask for forgiveness of your sins and invite Jesus to come into your life, that you can have that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Folks, creation is groaning. Not only creation groans, but believers groan. Believers. Look at verse 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groans with ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. You know what we do sometimes as senior adults? I'm in the lower category of the senior adults. We wake up and we figure out which parts are working and which parts aren't working. <laughs> Sometimes that knee just doesn't want to get up. Okay? Sometimes your eyes, you get up and it's just blurry for some reason. You look in the mirror and you think, oh my goodness. Lori and I looked at each other the other day and, and we said to each other, what happened to us? <laughs> what? We look like our grandparents did when they... <laughs> And then I realized we are grandparents. <laughs> and folks, I, I remember I used to, when I cut my grass, I used to cut front yard, backyard. Uh, I'd cut, you know, uh, you know, do the weed eating. I'd trim the bushes all in one setting. Now I pace myself. Okay? I do the weed eating one day. I do the grass the next day. I do, you, you get what I'm saying? These bodies are suffering. It's called old age, all right? And that's what he is saying. He's saying, man, can you imagine, folks, you are going to get a glorified body. We can't even describe it. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with hope perseverance. Oh, folks, we are, we are groaning because of spiritual battles and spiritual warfare in our lives. We are groaning for a place called heaven. We are hurting sometimes uh, when we look at the situations in life, when we want to do something and we realize we physically can't do that. When we, when we contact the diseases and these things and we have to be careful everywhere we go. And, you know, sometimes COVID just almost scares us. And, and folks, fear comes from Satan. We should not be afraid of anything. I'm, I will. I, you know, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, don't. I understand all of that. But the bottom line is I am not afraid to die because I know what is before us, what I have to look forward to is wonderful, wonderful things. Hold your finger there and go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you really think about it, folks, we are already there. If you are a Christian, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. I know we have life left here. I know uh, we have life to live, and I haven't done everything that I want to do in life. But I'm telling you, when you think about getting that glorified body and your body not hurting anymore, you should want to shout to the Lord, folks. It is a wonderful thought. And then it says, who will transfer our lowly body that it may be conformed into his glorious body according to the working by which he is able, able even to subdue all things under him. You know what First John says? We will be like Jesus. Can you imagine having a perfect body? There's, and, and I've heard I think J. Harold Smith was one of the ones that has said this because somebody has told me that his thought and several thoughts uh, of, of pastors are when we get to heaven, you're going to be uh, at the age of 33, the 33, which was the age that Jesus passed away. Why? Because 
Think about it when you were 33 years old. Folks, I'm telling you, you were in your prime. You were ready to take on the world. You didn't worry about things. You were living life. You were having a great time. And now that we've doubled our age, 66 now, I'm telling you, we struggle with life. And we struggle with life. But, folks, we have hope that is in Jesus. Listen to me. My hope is not in this world. There's nothing in this world I want. I know we have to live there. I know we work. I understand all of that. But my hope is in Jesus and in eternal life. The Bible says also in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, talking about these bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Folks, that same voice, Jesus Christ saying at the tomb of Lazarus, come forth is there for you and I also. He is going to resurrect our bodies, and we are going to get a new body. Verse 44, it is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. There's a natural body, and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Oh, folks, I want to be like Jesus. As long as I'm down here on this earth, that's not going to take place because of my sin nature. But I'm telling you, when we received our glorified bodies, when we uh, transfer up to heaven, we will be like Jesus. And one more verse. <coughs> Excuse me. Philippians 1. Look at Philippians 1, verse 19. Philippians 1.19, for I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supplication of the Spirit in Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and the hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Folks, Paul was not afraid to die. Matter of fact, Paul had a good feeling and, and he had a good intuition that, hey, he was going to die. He was going to be put to death. And folks, I think it's amazing that he had a lot of the characteristics that Jesus Christ had. Folks, he was persecuted. His body was beaten and torn. He was, he, he was put to death. He was put to death because he was a believer. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm telling you, I'm not afraid to die. You know why? You're going to threaten me with heaven? <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense at all. If someone come up, and I know this is just crazy, but put a gun in my face, I'm, I will not run. I will not be scared. I don't have a death wish. I want you to know this, okay? I don't have a death wish. But folks, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We ha need to have that confidence that Paul had. Now look at verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean, my, will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I choose I tell not, for I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, remain in the flesh is more needful for you. What is Paul saying? His work wasn't finished. Folks, you know why you're sitting here today? Because your work isn't finished. There's still a testimony that you need to have in your life. There's still a soul that you know that needs to be saved. There's still people that look at your life every day and want to know why you are different. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. So, creation groans, believers groan, and the Holy Spirit groans. Look back in our text at Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. Folks, I'm telling you, prayer is so important. 
in life's journey. We do not pray enough. I read an article the other day that said the average Christian prays five minutes a day. The average. Folks, I'm telling you, and you know why people don't pray? Because a lot of times they don't know how to pray or what to pray. And the Word of God here clearly says, if you will just begin praying, if you will ask God in Jesus, and especially the Holy Spirit, to help you in prayer, He will help you in prayer. Folks, prayer is that offensive weapon that we have. The armor of God is all in a defensive mode. You've you got the spiritual armor on. You're protecting yourself from the evil one. But you can charge uh, you know, and go forward with prayer. Prayer shouldn't be the last thing you do. Prayer should be the first thing you do. Why? Because God left the Holy Spirit here to help us in our prayers. And look what he says. For we should... For we know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit hurts for you. When you hurt, it hurts. And you can give your prayers and your hurts and your pain to God. And what we do, folks, we focus on the wrong thing. We focus on our situation and do not focus on God. Folks, God has a solution for everything that happens in our lives. He has a solution, and the Word of God helps with that. Now look at verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, but because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That Holy Spirit is that helper. It's that comforter. It's the one that gives you thoughts of what you need to pray for. It's the one that says, yes, this is the will of God in our lives. And so we have to depend on the Holy Spirit. And part of uh, you know, that is being a clean vessel. We need to be confessed up. We need to start our prayers with confession. And I'm telling you, I know when the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I know when uh, sometimes it almost seems like He is silent. And that's when I have to do some introspecting. And that's when I have to pray to God and pray to Jesus and, and pray to the Holy Spirit and say, God, I'm struggling with this. Would you help me? Would you help me, folks? He wants to help. And that's why He left us the Holy Spirit. And then verse 28, one of the most quoted Verses in the Word of God other than John 3.16 and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. Folks, there's a lot of things in life I don't understand. I've been in a lot of situations of life that I don't understand. I've seen death all around. I've literally seen Several people take their last breath in a hospital bed. I've seen accidents. I've seen all these things. And what Romans 8, 28 is saying, we're not going to understand every situation in life. But God is up to something. God is there for us. God's not wasting this time. God has a purpose in everything He does. Look at this, for we know that all things work together for good, for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. The two things that you have to remember, it's for our good. Even though we don't understand that, how can that be good? Folks, He can turn something that Satan means is bad, He can make it good. There's good that can come out of every situation of life, every tragedy of life, if you will look for the good, if you will look for God. But I've heard it many, many times. People, especially in the case of death, they're mad at God. Folks, that is not a smart thing to do. You're mad at the very person who can help you and get you through this. 
And it's for your good. Even though we don't understand it, God is sovereign. God is in control. And we need to let Him control all the situations we have in life. And not only is it for our good, it is for, our, for His glory. You know, to have a testimony, you have to have a test. Oh, listen, folks, I've been in life school 64 years now, and I still fail tests. God allows situations to come into my life to help me grow spiritually, to help me depend on Him more, to help me fall on my knees and pray, to help me learn from that mistake so that I can help others. But yet still, I fail because I'm looking at myself and not at God. I'm looking at my hurt and my pain instead of looking, hey folks, every situation in life, it has happened before. You are not the first and you won't be the last. So we have to look at the good and we have to look for God's glory. And then verse 29, he tells us why. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Why does he allow these things to happen? That verse says, so that we can be more like Jesus. You think of Jesus' life, folks. Man, he walked through hurt. He walked through pain. People called him ugly names. People lied on him. People abused him. People tried to take an advantage of him. All these things, folks, it's called suffering. Suffering. And nobody, I still say, the last 72 hours of Jesus' life, nobody has suffered the way Jesus did. He knows your pain. He will be there with you. There is purpose in that. Even when we can't see God's hand, folks, we have to trust His heart. He wants what's best for you. And I am telling you, it's not a thing of just thinking positive. It's focusing on the right thing. Focusing on Jesus Christ in our lives. And then verse 30, moreover, he predestined these, he predestined these he also called, and whom he called he justified, and whom he justified he glorified. Folks, you need to thank God that you are called to salvation. You are a child of the King. Nothing surprises God. There's no situation in, in, in life that God can't handle. All of that. He called you. He justified. He forgave you of your sins. He put a ring on your finger and a coat on your back. All your sins were erased as far as the east from the west. Dwell on that for a while, folks. And then He will glorify. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, maybe not here and now, but we will see God's glory. 2 Corinthians 4. Look at Look with me to 2 Corinthians 4, and I, I close with this. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And even in the time of suffering, don't give up hope. Don't let your faith, uh, you know, be weak, folks. Be strong in your faith. Know that God has a purpose in suffering. Know that when all is said and done, you will be a stronger Christian. You will be a stronger person. You will be an example of life to many others, knowing that he who... Re excuse me. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is renewing day by day. Folks, we have to spend time with God. Every day we have to spend time with God. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly in eternal weight of glory. Folks, God's making you more like Jesus. You are His 
example here on earth. And look what it says. And while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know what song comes to my mind, Steve? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. All sorrow will be gone, folks. All pain will be gone. The first 60 seconds in heaven, everything, every bad thing that ever you know, has happened to you, I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, it will be erased. You will remember it no more. No more temptation. No sin in heaven. And it will be a perfect place. Church, I'm telling you, Everyone has to suffer. Everyone goes through suffering. Everyone goes through pain. But it's like the song says, give it all, give it all to Jesus. Broken hearts, remember God is with you in suffering. And God's going to get you through suffering. Remember that God loves you with all his heart, even in time of suffering. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for Romans chapter 8. God, I thank you for verse 28. God, you know everything. You know everything about us. And God, we can't avoid suffering. But God, I pray that we won't get down. I pray that we will keep our eyes on Jesus. I pray that our faith would grow stronger. God, I pray that if some have just, you know, quit the race, God, I pray that they would get back up and they would run again. God, I pray that you strengthen folks that are here today. Those who are hurting, I pray you would mend the broken hearts. God, I pray that they would just focus on you and, and God, focus on the cross. God, thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for loving us. God, thank you for always being there for us. Thank you that 24 hours a day we can talk to you. We can cry out to you. We can give you everything in our lives. So God, I pray today those who are suffering would be encouraged to know that God is there and that God cares and that God loves them. God, I pray that we would pass the test of suffering. God, not for our glory, but for your glory. So God, would you be with people today? Would you love on people today? Would you give people hope today? Would you give people your love today? God, we love you. And if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, any other decision, any decision you put on their heart and mind, I pray they would follow through. And we'll give you the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.